finally, we are reviewing another Japanese role-playing game, and an indie game at that. Every now and then, which is about a bi-weekly basis, I go through the online shops from the Nintendo eShop and the PlayStation Online Store. One day, I came across an RPG-looking game with an interesting art design called The Bonds of the Skies, and it was on sale. So I decided to buy it after one look alone after looking at the trailer and because of a steep discount. Bonds of Skies was released back in August 17, 2013 for the Xbox One, the PlayStation 4, the PlayStation Vita, Android devices, iOS devices, Microsoft Windows, and the Nintendo Switch and Nintendo 3DS. Jeez, this game literally came out on everything at the time. This game sets out to capture a retro style approach with a game in presentation of execution, such as the old school Dragon Quest games. Still, I do want to start chipping away at my backlog, and considering the average playthrough for this game is about seven hours, it was like killing two birds with one stone, but without the birds or the stone. Bonds of Sky starts the tale of a young man named Eli who hails from a small town that devotes to the gods named Grimora, who have been believed to have created the world. During a coming of age ceremony for Eli, the town is attacked by what is thought to be a demon with fire. During a moment of desperation, Eli hears the voice of the Wind Grimora, Lord Nora, who offers his power as well as companionship to Eli to save the members of his town, as well as to pursue the suspect of the invasion, the Fire Grimora, Red Knot, because inevitably both of the characters have the same objective. Along the way, you will encounter a very brash knight by the name of Elks, who literally frames you for attacking his own village, along with the young woman named Ivy, who is a Sudanese town boy who is not afraid to speak to mine, and she will take nearly any and all instances to metaphorically call you, or Elks, a Baka. Sussy Baka. These two other characters also have their village attacked by the same suspect as well, so they have their own reasons among their own personal reasons for joining Eli on his quest. During the course of the journey, they get their own specific grimoire, which consists of the earth element for Elks and the water element for Ivy. And the three together form a bond of unlikely heroes to get to the bottom of the attacks in their hometowns and ultimately save the world. Where have we not heard something like that? <laughs> Throughout the story, I gotta say, this game did a great job at establishing the identity of the characters, their specific strengths, and more importantly, their flaws and ultimately how they overcame them. This indie game actually got me more invested into the party and their stories and their development alone, especially mainly Eli and Amy. They both experienced some real world struggles that we can all relate with. Eli, as the leader, has some confidence issues. While A.V. feels somewhat of an outcast by not being very feminine in terms of personality mannerisms, which lead her to believe that she is not as desirable as some of the other non-playable characters you will encounter throughout the game. At times, we often don't feel like we measure up or fit in with society, but as you play the game, you will see how these characters will be shaped up and how they cope with the struggles they feel internally. Visually, the game is pretty solid, considering all the console that the game can be found on. However, I have noticed that some sprites are used far more often than others, which gives it a little bit of a lazy appearance. But for me, it gets a pass because I'm pretty much an anime character every day, considering I wear the same two to four outfits these days during the pandemic. The sprite work for this game in the overworld, as well as the combat, has a nice style that harkens to something like the Super Nintendo, which, honestly, these types of visuals hold up very well, regardless of what console you are playing this on. One of the most interesting features for this game falls in line with the Grimoire themselves and when they level up. Each Grimoire is assigned to a specific character that cannot be moved, and as the character assigned completes battles, they both level up, increasing their stats, as well as learning some new abilities. However, as the Grimoire of levels up, there are certain abilities that can be actually given to their masters by utilizing the cost system, which is an array of abilities and stat boosts you will learn to apply to your character. This is very similar to how Kingdom Hearts utilizes their ability setup. This provides an interesting layer of customization 
that allows you to help add certain traits or increase certain party members' traits that can benefit depending on what is happening in the story or the boss that you may be encountering. In addition to the benefits of the Grimoire, you can also use a Synchro mechanic. Once the Synchro gauge is filled, it allows your character to further bond with their Grimoire and access much more powerful attacks, stat debuffs, buffs, and more ways to control the battlefield itself. The gauge itself is fueled up through various actions in combat, such as out dishing out damage, and of course, taking damage as well. Aside from that, with the gameplay and the combat, it's pretty straightforward considering it is a Japanese role-playing game. You can use physical attacks, magic attacks to attack your enemy, healing is also an option for recovery, buffs, debuffs are present to help you give an edge in combat when needed. And when you go to various towns as well, you're often going to want to stomp off at the shops to increase your weapon. And of course, the armor stats be able to help clear against the new areas due to power spikes are very much a thing. Crafting weapons and accessories are also a concept similar to how Dragon Quest XI handled the system. You can find recipes and materials in the overworld or apply cleaning quests found in every town to help create new items to increase your chance of success. Adding a new layer of gameplay that helps make the most use out of the scavenging mechanic and to fine tune your characters even further. At times, there may be some enemies more resistant or weak to magical and physical attacks as well, so being observant of the amount of damage they deal can make or break a fight indeed and ultimately just have to change up your strategy. For now, I did mention grinding. Bonds of Skies actually incorporates a fast forward feature up to three times the speed. So the grind sessions actually do go pretty fast. All right, four seconds is my limit before you risk a copyright strike. In addition to the fast forward feature, the game borrows even more from Persona or Earthbound and incorporates an auto battle system. Now, this is mainly your party spamming physical attacks. However, simplicity in this game which will be usually more than enough for grinding and farming experience. Another great feature of convenience include fast traveling to any location you've ever been to. Eventually, more quicker forms of transportation, such as boats and airboats, will be introduced throughout the story. A trait very unique to Bonds of Skies is how relaxed the game can be with you and your failures. When you fail in battle, the game presents you with an option of giving up or trying again right then and there with really no penalty. Now, this is interesting. Note, I said any fight. This applies to even random encounters in the overworld, boss fights, you name it. I like this. Now, you can look at this as a means of babying the player, and that could be true, because there's inherently no downside. However, if you look at it from a different perspective, it actually is saving you time. Considering the facts that, let's say you start at the beginning of the cave versus retrying the boss fight, what real value do you get out of being forced out to start from ground zero? In most instances, players save before entering a new arena or just a boss fight, if able, but at times this may not be the case and to help distinguish it, so having the option of either or is rather nice. After reaching about the 50 hour mark when it came with completion of the game, it dawned on me just how repetitive the game is though. The game essentially is you enter a town, get some story exposition, leave the town, go to a dungeon-like area, fight the boss, achieve some kind of grimoire, return to town, then set off in a different direction to do this all over again. So if you're into JRPGs and understand this is commonplace in most games of this genre, then by all means, continue. Not a bad thing at all. Honestly, even though some of the story bits in between are actually pretty good at these sections, the game has a very interesting layer of humor between the humans and the grimoire that honestly just feel very heartfelt and genuine and help kind of distract the fact that the world is pretty much ending. Honestly, there are some really weird difficulty spikes you will encounter from time to time within this game as well. The biggest one was literally actually the first encounter of the red grimoire, Red Rock. I swear, I had to grind about 10 levels to even stand a chance. However, thanks to the ease of grinding, it didn't so much feel like a chore, like in most other JRPGs, but rather it felt more like an inconvenience, if that makes sense. Which I suppose even makes the concept of reaching a certain level of milestones feel less important, considering how simple and easy it is. 
Another issue I've experienced a few times with playing this game, the PlayStation 4 port of this game, mind you, is that there were some moments where the game would not register my butt input for the PS4 controller. Now, this mainly only happened during segments with text boxes, and since this is a Japanese role-playing turn-based game, it doesn't put the player at a disadvantage, but it just becomes a point of annoyance. All in all, Bonds of Skies with a bit of surprise in terms of enjoyment and I've considering it when it was an impulse pickup. The game pays homage to the classic that it was inspired off to begin with. Just enough quality of life touches for modern games to make it both welcoming to both new and veteran players of the JRP genre. One of the biggest downsides is that it really didn't have anything truly to call its own stand out in a revolutionary way. Although, but the game itself having some quality of life improvements over some other JRPGs makes this a convenient playthrough and a warm addition from an indie developer themselves. With a great cast of characters through their own coming of age stories and their own growth in their own way, it can be a great quick pickup game for those who are a fan of JRPG. Thanks for watching everyone. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, as well as some other JRPG hidden gems out there. I'm always down for looking into new games these days. Also, if you're not, why not check out my Twitch page where I live stream games every Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and sometimes Wednesdays. We would love to have you be a part of that community. Subscribe for more awesome content and I will catch you, yes you, in the next video. Peace.